everybody. Uh, welcome to the OpenEye webinar covering shape-based methods in drug discovery. Uh, my name is Matt Jabal. I'm an application scientist at OpenEye, and I'll be running uh, the webinar uh, on the back end here. Um, so we're going to try to stick to one hour for this presentation. Um, please feel free to ask questions in the chat window. Uh, however, we're going to hold uh, answering questions until the end of the presentation. Um, and if we don't get to all of the questions, then we will answer them individually by email uh, afterwards. Also, the slides and the video of this presentation will be made available to you, um, and we'll send you links to that in a follow-up email. So uh, I'd like to introduce Paul Hawkins, who will be giving the presentation today. Paul is the group leader of the application scientists at OpenEye, and he's been with the company for about eight years now, uh, spending a lot of that time dealing with shape-based methods. So I'll turn it over to Paul. Thanks, Matt. So I will be introducing our shape-based technology uh, rocks for a variety of different purposes in drug discovery and computational molecular modeling. I will attempt to cover the main areas, and again, as Matt said, if you have any questions about things I say or don't say, uh, please feel free, <clears throat> excuse me, please feel free to ask through the chat, and I will attempt to answer as many questions in the time as we have, but I will follow up with everyone by email. So to begin, I wanted to make a philosophical statement about the way that we at OpenEye approach computational drug design and molecular modeling, and that's really by looking at these two fundamental molecular properties on the slide, shape at the left, and electrostatic potential on the right. These two, we believe, are the fundamental, both fundamental physical properties and fundamentally relevant descriptors for uh, computational drug discovery, because when we are considering the protein ligand binding event, we understand that the shape of the ligand has to conform to the shape of the protein binding site to a large degree, and the electrostatic potential presented by the ligand in the binding site has to complement the electrostatic potential that exists from the protein. And if either or both of those things is not the case, it's very unlikely that that will be a successful protein ligand interaction. So these are two fundamental physical properties that are very important to model and understand correctly when we're thinking about the protein ligand binding event, which is the key event that most of computational drug discovery is concerned with. So today we're going to focus on shape. And there are a number of properties that shape has that we really like as a method for building tools for today's purposes, particularly around virtual screening and lead hopping. And that is illustrated on the cartoon here. So you've got two molecules on the slide, which as you inspect them, don't appear particularly similar. That similarity or lack of similarity is reflected in their graph-based similarity. I show you there that number 0.12 is a Tanamoto coefficient based on path fingerprints, so a graph-based method, for the similarity between the two. On a scale of 0 to 1, that's a very small number. So this conforms with our intuition that these molecules are not similar in their graphs. However, when we look at their similarity in shape, their similarity in shape computed using a Tanamoto coefficient, what we call the shape Tanamoto, is 0 0.9 on a scale of 0 to 1. There's a great deal more significant shape similarity than there is similarity in the graph. Why is this relevant? Well, it turns out these two molecules have very similar biology. They're both binders for the same protein, CDK2, and they both have about the same binding affinity, around 10 nanomoles. So what I would suggest we're seeing here is shape exhibiting good neighborhood behavior, high similarity in shape being reflected of high similarity in biology, whereas that high similarity in biology is not reflected in the similarity in 2D. So the good neighborhood behavior that shape is showing here is really the fundamental basis for why we find shape to be a successful method for both virtual screening and for lead hopping. Similarity in shape being predictive of similarity in biology. So as I mentioned, the main applications I will be discussing today will be the first two on the slide here, virtual screening and lead hopping. I will spend a little time discussing the other side of, of the, uh, the rocks-based output and that is the molecular alignment themselves. Uh, the last part on the slide here I won't discuss today, but we do have a recently released tools for doing pose prediction, 
host generation in a protein binding site in a ligand centric shape derived way. And that tool is called POSIT. So, virtual screening, lead hopping, and so on are a number of different problems that we have developed solutions for. And when we put our solutions into the context of electrostatically centric tools or shape centric tools, we end up with the cartoon on the slide. The tools at the top in the gray oval are tools we use for preparation for some of these experiments for analyzing the results, visualizing the results, and communicating them to people who'd like to see what we've done. The two colored circles, blue, contains the tools that use in whole or in part electrostatic methods. The red circle contains tools that use in whole or in part shape-based methods. And within that circle, you can see the tool here, rocks. And that will be the topic for the rest of today. Now, when we take those same tools and we put them into a workflow, so the output for one being the input for another, you will see in the center of the slide a set of tools which we are using for database preparation, tools like Filter, Quackpack, Omega. Then we will see to the bottom left tools using ligand-centric techniques, easy shape with rocks, electrostatic with Eon. Then in the middle at the bottom, structure-centric tools like Fred and Hybrid. And on the right, tools which are using shape or electrostatic methods in a protein-centric way, but not dependent on these other input tools. So again, our tool of choice today is ROGS, a tool for shape alignment and scoring. So the basic premises for ROGS operation are fairly simple. It requires you to give it a query, and that query would normally be, for virtual screening and lead hopping operation, a molecule with some interesting biological activity in at least one 3D conformation. The other is the database of molecules that you are searching, and those have to be in conformationally expanded format. The reason for that requirement for conformational expansion for the database molecules is that the ROCS calculation, as I'll explain in a moment, is entirely rigid. We use a rigid process involving translation and rotation only to align conformations of each database molecule to this three-dimensional query. The reason, one of the reasons we like the rigid approach is it's really rather fast. Depending on the type of calculation that you do and the hardware you do it on, you should expect speeds between one and 2,000 conformers per second. Depending on the number of conformers per molecule, that speed translates to something between 20 and 40 molecules per second. I'll get back to the speed later on. The output from rocks is an alignment between the database molecule and the query and a set of scores reflecting the quality of that alignment looking at two separate molecular properties. The alignment and score based on shape and the score based on what we call color, which is the distribution of chemical features in three dimensions. So when we look at the way that the uh, calculation is uh, taking place, we begin with the query molecule in one or more confirmations. We then take the database molecule confirmation by confirmation, and we begin the calculation by aligning the two molecules, uh, sorry, overlaying the molecules based on their centers of mass and aligning them along their principal moments of inertia. From those starting points, we optimize to maximize the shape and the color similarity, the similarity in chemical features in 3D, in a rigid process between that query and that database conformer. We then find the optimized uh, overlap. We compute the score for that. We repeat this process for each confirmation of the query if there's more than one, and each confirmation for the database molecule. And by default, we report the best matching confirmate match between any confirmation of the query and any confirmation of the database molecule. So then the basic output from rocks is an overlay between the query and the database molecule. The query here is in light green, the database molecule is dark green, and it's the two CDK2 molecules I briefly mentioned earlier. So that's one part of the output, the other are the scores representing various aspects of that um, alignment. The two core scoring methods are shown on the top right here. The shape Tanimoto, just about 0.9, representing the overlap of, of shared volume and mismatched volume. And then the color Tanimoto, which again scales between zero and one and is reflective of the degree of matching or mismatching of like chemical features in three dimensions. Now, the Tanimoto combo score is the sum of those two independent components, the shape and the color Tanimoto, and that is the basic ranking measure we use in our virtual screening and lead hopping experiments. Now, you'll see by implication here that we apply equal importance, equal weight, to the similarity in shape and to the similarity in color. 
Each is equally important in its own way, and we have not found that tuning these, giving one greater weight than the other, generally improves performance. So the somewhat naive assumption that both are equally important in their own way turns out to be uh, the method that gives us the best overall performance. So the Tanamoto combo is simply the sum of the unweighted shape and color Tanamoto components. Now that information I just showed you was in 3D. We also have a method of representing that overlay between the database molecule and the query in 2D. I'll get back to this method called the ROCKS report at the end of the talk, but just to illustrate to you, using those same molecules, I can depict the query in 2D. I can show you its shape, which is the series of dotted lines around the molecule here. And I can show you the color features, these filled colored circles, representing the different kinds of chemical features the query has. And then I can show you the overlay of the database molecule in a 3D depiction inside the shape of the query by the dotted line, giving you an understanding of what the shape Tanamoto means. The simile, we can look at the match and mismatch between the color features in the database molecule and the color features in the query, representing by these filled and unfilled color circles, telling us a little bit about how to understand the color Tanamoto. So I'll get back to this representation later on. So just to let you know that we can uh, analyze these results both in their native 3D form and in an informative two-dimensional form. So as I mentioned, our basic properties we're looking at in box are shape and color, color being chemical feature distribution in 3D. So what we do is we take a molecule, we then apply the shape and color model to it. I'll discuss the model in just a second. And then the actual substrate for the rocks calculation is a series of color features embedded in a shape. It's not the actual molecule. So we can have a lot of flexibility in how we represent a query in rocks. And I'll talk a little bit about what advantages this can bring in a few minutes. Now, the basic method that we use to represent shape and color features in rocks is using a Gaussian function. So I'll show you a diagram here of what a Gaussian function in red and blue looks like relative to a hard sphere model in green, the hard sphere model being more the CPK sort of model that we are used to seeing. The functional form of the Gaussians described by the equation on the top left. And simply by adjusting the exponent of that uh, formula, we can generate a spherical Gaussian function that represents the volume of a sphere very accurately. Now, the Gaussian offer provides us a lot of different uh, advantages, both in terms of the arithmetic and the mathematics involved in overlay and scoring. More relevant to the day-to-day -day user, the Gaussian represents, uh, in a fairly simple way, local molecular or atomic flexibility. And it also provides us with a method of continuous scoring. So features that are relatively distant from one another in rocks still acquire an overlap score. It's just very small. So here we have an idea of continuous scoring as against more traditional pharmacophore type tools, which use a, a discontinuous or binary sort of scoring method in or out the pharmacophore with or out. And here, we simply give you a better score when the features are closer together and a poorer score when the features are further apart. So the, the scoring is continuous because we have this spherical Gaussian approximation we're using instead of the standard CPK hard sphere model. Now, as I mentioned, because we use this Gaussian-based method, we have a great deal of flexibility in how we represent a query. Normally, it's a molecule, and most of the work that I do and most of the work that our customers do is using a single molecule in a single confirmation. So multiple confirmations, as I mentioned, can easily be used. I'll talk a little bit about the method we use for generating a single query from two or more molecules, and that's illustrated in the middle picture here. It's two molecules combined into a single query species. And we can also use fragments, disconnected, non-chemically meaningful pieces of a molecule that you have uh, arrived at either through disconnecting pieces of an active molecule, docking fragments into a binding site, or possibly even through crystallographic. So these are all pieces of a molecule. We can, because we use this Gaussian-based abstraction of a molecule, actually represent our queries, calculate queries, based not on molecules, but on grids which allows us to expand the uh, focus of rocks calculations away from molecules at all into either experimentally derived grid, as I show here with a grid of electron density from an X-ray crystallographic experiment, or grids computed using any kind of different software that computes grids of molecular properties. And all of those can be used, if we can read the grid format, directly in rocks along with the more normal molecules. 
So we have a great deal of flexibility available in the representation of the query and where the query comes from. The work I will discuss in the rest of the talk is all using queries uh, from single molecules in single confirmations, but there are a lot of other approaches that you can use to expand the applicability of rocks to your problem. So first I want to talk about rocks application in virtual screening. And what I, I hope to be able to do is uh, show you that it is a very effective solution, both in terms of its performance and its speed, and is rather better than some of the other alternatives you might normally consider, uh, things like fingerprint-based methods and stocking. So virtual screening has become an extremely popular technique in the last few years. The paper uh, came out in Drug Discovery today looking at reports in the literature for actual screening shown in the light gray bars, high throughput screening, and virtual screening in the dark gray, the black bars. And as you can see, virtual screening is becoming exponentially more popular, probably, I'm sure, partly because it's very cheap. Uh, so it's becoming a, and it's going to be an important part of everybody's uh, discovery armamentarium. So I want to look a little bit about how we do virtual screening in the open eye world. We have a very simple way of thinking about the way we get ready. So we'll take a collection of compounds we'd like to screen. We do a few simple database preparation steps, one of which includes that confirmation expansion step I mentioned with our tool Omega. And that generates a screening database with molecules of the right properties in the right form, confirmationally expanded, ready for screening. We can do some query preparation, particularly for 3D techniques like ROCKS. And I will discuss a little bit of the methods we can use for query preparation and customization through a graphical interface we have for ROCKS called VROX. With that in hand, we can then use ROCKS to screen the database. And we can use this as a complement or an alternative to structure-centric techniques, which will begin with the same database, but again, looking at a protein model, performing some kind of docking experiment. And something that's very interesting to us is the ability or the uh, approach of combining structure-centric and ligand-centric techniques in the same uh, calculation, which I don't have time to talk about today, but it's something that we are actively researching from a number of different angles. So in terms of the databases that you'll screen, as I mentioned, you need to do a confirmation expansion. All the results I will talk about today, both generated by other people and with uh, our own results, have been using confirmation databases from Omega. You can use other confirmation generators, provided they write a common exchange format like SDF or MOL2. Uh, your mileage may vary. Your results will certainly be slower if you use these other formats. I can't really speak to what the overall performance will be, um, but it's certainly you're certainly not tied to using Omega, but all the results I will show you are from Omega. One of the other questions commonly arising from database preparation is how should I protonate my molecules? And the uh, simple answer is in ROCKS world, it doesn't matter. The uh, protonation state in the default method of using ROCKS is essentially perceived, if you will, from the heavy atoms only. So a carboxylate, two oxygens and a, and a carbon, is perceived as an anion and, a, and an acceptor, irregardless of the actual presence or absence of a proton. You can take account of that if you want using a non-default method of doing chemistry perception in the chemistry model, but that's not the default way. So it hopefully somewhat simplifies your life that the protonation state is applied in a consistent and fast, fast method across all the molecules in your database. Now, when I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the performance of any tool, rocks or otherwise, in, in an experiment, the question that should be uppermost in your mind is, well, it all sounds very clever. You know, rocks have Gaussians and color features, and it's all very sophisticated sounding. Um, but one, does it work? But more importantly, does it work better than doing something which is much less complicated? Do we have to do all this 3D stuff with Gaussians? Can we do something a little bit less complex? Um, so one way of asking that is to pose the question of what the performance is of a particular technique relative to what you might call its null model, where the null model attempts to answer the question, how well would I do if I didn't do what I'm doing? So if you look at three commonly used methods in virtual screening, fingerprinting, 3D ligand-based techniques, and 3D structure-centric techniques like docking, I can generate some idea of what an appropriate null model might be. So for 2D fingerprint-based methods, a simple null model would be, instead of ranking by fingerprint similarity, would be ranking by the number of heavy atoms in the smile stream, something that you could say is one-dimensional. Uh, similarly then, the probable likely null model for three-dimensional ligand-centric techniques is two-dimensional ligand-centric techniques. So fingerprint methods would be the null model for shape or pharmacophore methods. 
Um, for protein-centric docking methods, I think it's certainly arguable that the null model for a 3D protein-centric method is a 3D ligand-centric method. How well would we do if we didn't use the protein? Then we don't use the protein, we don't do docking. So I want to talk a little bit about rock performance relative to its null model and see how well it does versus the other techniques that it is the null model for. So firstly, looking at rock and its null model, here I show uh, virtual screening performance for two different kinds of techniques, a path-based fingerprint technique, and those results are in blue, rocks results in red. I have two different aggregate metrics, the mean in the left, the median on the right. My figure of merit here is the AUC on the y-axis. That's the area under the curve for a receiver operator characteristic. That number scales between zero and one. 0 0.5 is random, one is perfect performance, where perfect performance would be placing all the active molecules at the top of the list. And as you can see from the legend, I've got aggregates across 38 separate ex virtual screening experiments from the DUD data. So fairly simply, you can see there's a fairly substantial numerical difference in the mean, a slightly smaller numerical difference in the median, rocks outperforming both. I can apply a fairly simple um, paired student t-test to those results for the mean. And I can give you a p-value for the null hypothesis that 2D and rocks are the same, of less than 0.01, or the other way around is, I'm more than 99% confident that rocks has outperformed 2D, it's outperformed its null model on this data set. So that answers the first question, are we doing something of greater value with this sort of sophisticated Gaussian-centric shape and color method? And the answer is yes, we are doing something better than simply using the null model 2D. Now, when we take it a step further and we look at one of the other very common virtual screening methods, which is docking, in most cases, docking is performed into a protein ligand complex, shown in the top middle here. And in most docking experimentation, you take the complex apart, you remove the ligand, and dock into the binding site, asking what fits the shape and the chemical feature distribution in the binding site, using some scoring. In Rock's world, we would take the same protein ligand complex, we would disassemble it and discard the protein and ask what matches the shape and chemical feature distribution of the ligand. Assuming that the protein binds it, it likes that shape and that chemical feature distribution. So in that sense, we could argue that ROX is the null model for docking. We don't use the protein, we simply use the ligand from the protein ligand complex. We would then say this is the, the null model for docking. So keep that in mind as I talk about some of the results over the next few slides where I'm going to look at various virtual screening techniques, which will always include docking because it is a very popular solution for virtual screening across a lot of different problems. So the first data I want to talk about came from a study from uh, Merck Pharmaceuticals across several different sites at Merck, published a few years ago, looking at a collection of targets of common pharmaceutical interest. The names are at the top of the slide there. A lot of different techniques were compared. I don't want to talk about all the different uh, comparisons that were conducted, but it's a very thoroughgoing study, part of which was comparing structure and ligand-based techniques, both 2D and 3D ligand-based techniques, with docking-centric methods. The best of the uh, 3D ligand-based techniques turned out to be rocks, and in the case of rocks, what we're doing is taking these PDB structures, removing the ligand, and using the ligand in its X-ray confirmation as the query, searching a confirmationally expanded Omega database, and we're going to compare the results of that method of virtual screening versus docking into the same uh, protein ligand complex. So the best of the docking tools in this study turned out to be GLIDE. So when we compare the best of the 3D ligand-centric techniques, box with the best of the docking method, GLIDE, the data is aggregated on the slide here. Again, we're looking at aggregates across 11 separate experiments. Our figure of merit on the y-axis here is, again, that area under the curve for the ROC, bounded by zero and one, 0.5 is random, one is perfect. The means for the two methods are in red, the median's in purple. The standard error for the mean is the thick gray, the black error bar. So again, numerically, there's some substantial separation between the docking method and rocks. And again, a simple uh, paired student t-test gives me a P for the null hypothesis that glide and rocks are the same, of less than 0.025, or another way around, I'm 97.5% confident or better that ROX outperforms GLIDE on this data set. So again, what we say here is that ROX is actually outperforming the technique for which it's supposed to be its null model, which is an interesting observation. Now, what came out of that study was that when the Merck authors compared all the techniques they looked at for 
four different success criteria. Speed, reliability in terms of minimal inter-target variability, performance consistent across different targets. High hit rate, high enrichments, high AUC, and diversity in the structures, rocks turned out to be the best technique for pulling all of these different approaches. So what happened after that is that um, Merck, particularly Merck in Canada, ceased to use docking for virtual screening and looked at docking as a tool for pose prediction and turned to ligand-centric techniques, 2D and 3D methods, for their virtual screening studies day to day. Now, this is nicely uh, confirmed by some more recent data from, again, a retrospective study on a new version of the uh, database looking at uh, subsets of that database with deliberately highly diverse sets of ligands, highly diverse sets of actives, where they've been deliberately selected to be very different from one another at the graph level. So we're challenging here three different virtual screening methods to, to recover or discover new types of chemical classes because all the molecules in these data sets are very different to one another. Here our figure of merit on the y-axis isn't the overall performance of the AUC. It's enrichment of 1% more reflective of the kind of day-to-day -day operations that people will do with virtual screening, rank a set of molecules and take simply the very top ranked molecules for further study, experimental or theoretical. So our enrichment 1% shown here, the means are in blue, the medians are in red uh, for the three tools in question, docking tool on the left, pharmaceutical tool in the middle, rocks on the right. And again, we're using the crystallographic ligand in its crystallographic confirmation as the query. So we're starting with the same input data, a protein ligand complex, the protein used as the substrate for docking, the ligand used as the substrate for the rocks calculation, so again, I can do some fairly simple uh, student t tests on these to give me, again, on this data set, a P for rocks outperforming glide of less than 0.01. So again, I'm 99% confident on this data set, we're seeing a superior performance for rocks over glide. The other interesting thing to come out of this experiment is an estimation of what I mentioned in the Merck study of inter-target variability. And that can be estimated by looking at the, the absolute difference between the mean and the median. In the, if the mean and the median are very different, what that means is there's a couple of very good results giving a high mean, or a very, couple of very bad results giving a low mean relative to the median. So when we look at the two differences here, we see a fairly substantial mean to median difference for glide, but a fairly small difference mean to median for rock. What this means is, what, what I would suggest this might mean, is that because we base rocks on a fundamental physical property of a molecule, its shape, we don't really have any parameters in rocks. There, aren't, there isn't any tuning or parameterization that's going on in the development of rocks and the algorithm. Whereas for docking engines, glide, and all the others, there's a degree of parameterization involved, in some cases a very heavy degree of parameterization, which means the tool performs very well when it's been exposed to systems akin to those upon which it was parameterized. But it performs very variably, often badly, when it's exposed to systems upon which it has not been parameterized, giving the result high fragility reflected in that large difference between the mean and the median. So these two are all retrospective studies. What we can also do is look at some prospective work, um, an aggregation of prospective work published from the Jürgen Bioras lab a few years ago, looking at the reported virtual screening studies using a number of different types of methods, docking, 2D, and 3D methods, and looking at those techniques that found high fractions or higher fractions of potent molecules. So what they're looking at here on the y-axis as their figure of merit is the fraction of hits reported which were less than a micromolar in the assay in question, IC50, KI, EC50, whatever it may be. And then they aggregate various different techniques and show the, fra the fraction of hits found by these different methods. And as you see here, the, in the prospective study, the docking techniques performed the worst. And interestingly, docking into homology models appeared to be better than docking into X-ray models, which is striking. Uh, 3D met methods, a little bit better than 2D, and perhaps pleasingly, combining 2D and 3D in an intelligent way, the column on the far right, has turned out to be a very effective method indeed. So the prospective methods appear to be very nicely in concert with the retrospective data that ligand-based techniques, 3D, 3D and 2D, are a very effective solution to virtual screening in a prospective sense as well. So to summarize quickly what I said about virtual screening with rock, it's a very fast method, around 20 to 40 molecules per second, depending on the level of confidence sampling and the exact type of calculation you do. I hope I've shown you that it's very effective. It's certainly 
better than, than docking. I think it's something we see consistently in our own studies and in results from the literature. And certainly when we look at comparisons to the null model 2D, we see uh, superior performance often and also a higher diversity, a higher structural difference in the head. I'll talk a little bit at the end of the talk about this tool VROCKS, our visual interface, our graphical interface to ROCKS in terms of how that helps you customize queries to improve your virtual screening performance. But for now, that's all I wanted to say about the virtual screening part. I wanted to move on and talk about lead hopping. Now, as I mentioned at the very beginning, analogs in shape, molecules that are similar in shape, are not by any means similar in 2D, as I showed you with that CDK2 cartoon example. Now, lead hopping and virtual screening are not, in everyone's mind, entirely separate experiments. But what I want to do here is focus not on the absolute performance, but on the different types of compounds that have been revealed by using uh, rock searches, using uh, this idea that shape is a fundamentally important predictor of um, biology. So the first study I want to talk about is a very, very extreme example of a low information starting point. In the retrospective studies I have uh, discussed, we have really quite a lot of information, atomic resolution structures of the protein of interest with an active molecule. In this study, all that was known at the beginning is this molecule, mefloquine, is active against uh, a viral infection of brain cells by a virus called the JC virus. The mechanism of action and therefore the target protein for mefloquine are unknown. So an experimental structure for mefloquine cannot be arrived at. The target protein isn't known. So what the investigators here did is to simply compute a confirmation for this molecule, the lowest energy confirmation from omega. They use this to screen the MDDR to find molecules with high similar shape and chemical features, but different chemical structures. Tested a small handful of them and found two very interestingly active molecules with around the same level of activity in this phenotypic in vivo assay as the original query mesoquine. You see here on the left, three DDAs of adenosine, and on the right, eight chloro. AMP. And they're around the same activity. So what we've seen here is purely based on the assumption that similarity in shape is reflective of similarity in biology, these investigators were able to find very new different types of chemical matter with similar to biology to a known molecule without any knowledge of the protein target. So that's a very, I think, interesting example of how similarity in shape, absent any other information, is predictive of similarity in biology. Another example using a slightly better studied system, though still without any protein ligand structures, reported um, from the pharmacology group at Oxford just recently, looking at screening the FDA's Orange Book, a collection of approved known drugs uh, approved for use in man, to find new molecules that are antihistamines. So what they did is they used rocks to find molecules in the approved library of drugs that are similar to one or more known antihistamines. Again, the confirmations for these known antihistamines are not accessible experimentally. There is no structure for the histamine H1 receptor available to date. So they compute a calculate, compute or calculate a confirmation with omega, screen the approved drug library for that to find molecules similar in shape. The molecules that are similar in shape to multiple different antihistamines are selected, tested for activity, and of the handful that are tested, three molecules turned out to be interestingly active against H1. Chlorprothixine at the top, pentolamine on the left, and lobaline at the bottom, none of which had been known previously to have any activity on H1. They all approved the drugs and therefore have a good safety profile and so on. So this is essentially a drug repurposing effort using only, again, the idea that similarity in shape to an antihistamine is predictive of activity on uh, a histamine receptor. So what we've done here is find these new uh, these known drugs, these old drugs, with new biological uh, activity, not previously recognized. So again, in both of these cases, no target protein information is available, no bound confirmation to the active is available. We simply compute a calculation, compute a confirmation with omega, and use that in the rock search. Now, this obviously then leads to the question, if I had the X-ray confirmation, how much better would I have done? How much of the sacrifice did I make using the calculated confirmation because I don't have access to the crystal graph. If you don't have access to it, should you try to figure out what it is? Should you wait for the experiment, which could take months? Or should you simply proceed 
based on the idea that nearly every interesting molecule you'll come across will have no structural information available. So what I, what I did was, using the 38 databases from the DUD data set, I compared the crystallographic confirmation from the PDB to the lowest energy computed confirmation for the same molecule using omega. So then I can compare the virtual screening performance of the bound confirmation from the PDB to the lowest energy confirmation for omega and see what the cost is. And it turns out when we look at uh, early enrichment as a figure of merit, that's the figure on the uh, y-axis here, there is no difference between the two the means on the left, the medians on the right, x-ray in blue, omega in red. For early enrichment, the x-ray confirmation gives exactly the same performance as the omega, which is good news. If you have the x-ray confirmation, obviously you should use it, but if you don't, you should compute a low energy confirmation with omega, search with that, with every expectation that your average success will be just the same as if you did uh, have access to that x-ray confirmation. Now, an alternative measure of the virtual screening success is that area under the curve, the AUC I mentioned earlier, and that tells a slightly different story. The median on the right there is exactly the same for both, so the median AUC shows there's no difference. The mean AUC, again pulled up by a couple of good examples, shows a little separation, however it's not statistically significant. So I would again, even doing some fairly detailed statistics on this, still stand by the argument that in a prospective sense, the omega confirmation will serve you just as well as the crystal graphic. So if you don't have access to the crystal graphic, proceed with an omega confirmation with the expectation that you're going to get just as good an overall outcome. So to look at the lead hopping in a little bit of a summary, I believe that shape has shown itself to be effective in lead hopping because it shows good neighborhood behavior, similarity in shape, reflective of similarity in biology. It also has broadly applicable because the success is not tied to knowledge of the bound or the bioactive confirmation, which makes it accessible to any molecule that you could find in a publication, a patent, a molecule that you've simply dreamt up. All of these can be used effectively because you're not tied to success to knowing the bound confirmation. So I want to talk very briefly about molecular alignment, and I'm going to just skip over a couple of pieces here, but to remind you that the basic output from ROCKS is an alignment between the query here in light green and the database molecule in dark green, which you can visually or programmatically interrogate to understand how molecules of different structures, again, these are the two CDK2 ligands, have shared features, different molecular architectures, but similar distribution of chemical features. So this can obviously be done, as you see here, simply visually, or you could make a slightly broader effort to um, interrogate these programmatically. So I'm going to skip over a little bit here because time is getting on. And I want to just briefly mention a, a recent publication from, or a series of publications actually, from Mike Feet's lab at Lilly and Company in Indianapolis, looking at ligand-based methods for pose prediction. So here we're looking at doing a pose prediction experiment against a crystallographic ligand, but without any protein information. So it's a cross-docking method where we take a set of different ligands, pose them in some method against a known crystallographic confirmation for a molecule active against the same protein target, and we see how well that prediction matches to the experimental confirmation. The figure of merit here is the percentage of the alignments that give uh, a predicted overlay that's within two angstrom RMSD of the experimental, so the standard docking success cutoff. The entire data set numbers are aggregated on the left under all. So you see, if you knew what the best method in advance was, your success rate would be a little over 55%, which is exactly where the best of the docking engines come on this same data set. The particular tools, rocks in black, flex S in gray, phase in the diagonal, and field compare in the checkers. Target to target performance varies significantly for some of the tools, but the aggregate on the left here clearly shows that flex S and uh, rocks, which happen both to be uh, Gaussian-centric methods, rocks being rigid, flex S being, as you'd expect, uh, flexible, very similar performance, rather better than field compare and phase as an aggregate. So what we're seeing here is we're successfully able to do prediction of a ligand pose uh, in a protein active site without actually using information about the protein active site at all. We're only using information about the confirmation of the bound ligand. So for alignment, 
it's a pretty fast method, as I mentioned, we're doing alignments at 20 to 40 molecules per second. So it's much faster than docking. And for cross-docking, it turns out its performance is actually very analogous and somewhat better in some cases to cross-docking performance using docking tools. So there is a lot of information to be had from simply the 3D conformation of a bound ligand in the absence of the, uh, the corresponding protein if you go about extracting that information in the right way. So those are the three things I wanted to discuss, virtual screening, lead hopping, and alignment as far as the basic results and the basic techniques that we can apply rocks to. I wanted to conclude by giving you a brief mention of some of the things I haven't had time to talk about. Uh, one of the very interesting new developments for using rocks recently has been for library design, molecule profiling to ensure that you cover shape space in your library in a consistent and adequate fashion. And some recent work that's come out from a lab of actually maybe one of the attendees, Matt Tyke, on looking at, instead of on-target activity, which is what I've been discussing up to now, looking at off-target activity. Can we predict the likelihood of side effects? Microsomal stability binding to cytochrome P450s by, again, the analogy that if a molecule is similar in shape to a binder for a cytochrome P450, it's likely also to be a binder for that cytochrome. So we can also look at this similarity in biology, not only for on-target effects, but also for side and off-target effects, looking at selectivity and side effects. Okay. So before I conclude, I wanted to give you two brief looks at some of the surrounding tools for the, uh, using ROCs. The first is the VROX interface, which I mentioned briefly earlier. And that really is designed to help create and validate virtual screening queries. And I'll talk about that in just a second. And then I'll discuss a little bit about this ability to represent 3D information from a ROCs calculation in 2D using this thing I call the ROCs report method. So first thing I'll talk about the interface, VROX. So VROX's basic idea is to provide you with a straightforward graphical interface to generate from a molecule a query. So as I mentioned at the beginning, because we have this Gaussian method of doing feature and shape representation, we don't have to use a molecule as a query. We can disconnect the idea of a query from a molecule. So this VROX interface allows you to generate queries from two or more molecules together and customize those queries in a variety of different ways. So I'll briefly look at the customization idea. On the left here is a query derived from a molecule. Each feature has its appropriate matching uh, chemical feature and its matching shape. On the right is a query generated from this molecule. So here's the molecule. And some of the things we've done, for example, have been to weight the chemical features and the shape features of this query on the right differently to how they're weighted in the molecule on the left. So we have, for example, from our understanding of the SAR, decided that the sub-pocket that this ring occupies is critical. It must be occupied by some part of a good ligand. So we can reflect that information in the building of a query by adding what we call shape weight. These atoms now are much more important in the overlay and scoring process when matching a shape of a new molecule to the shape of this query. Similarly, we've added extra weight to important chemical features. This acceptor here and this acceptor here are identical in the original molecule, but we know from SAR, for example, that this oxygen, the sulfonamide, is more important as an acceptor than this one. We know the warhead portion here, this amidinium species, the donor cation donor triple, is more important than other donor cation species in the same molecule. And we can reflect that importance by adding feature weight. So we can say this is more important, in this case, three times more important to have donor cation donor matching here in the warhead than we have up here in this side chain. So the consequence for that is when we look at virtual screening, here again, we're looking at uh, a rock plot, virtual screening using the standard molecule, the results from red, and using the weighted query in blue, we can significantly improve our virtual screening performance by intelligent weighting and uh, manipulation of the shape and the chemical features in the molecule to generate a customized query. And that's one of the main points of using VROX. Now, the other end of the process in any of these uh, experiments is to analyze, understand, and usually communicate your results to other members of the group on your project. And one of the ways we've gone about doing that is through this ROCKS report method. So what I show here in the top left is a query in a 3D confirmation used in a ROCKS. What we can do using the ROCKS report is reflect 
the 3D overlay of the rock uh, results in two dimensions, so we can depict the 3D conformation in two dimensions. So, for example, here in this input query, the chlorine here of this amino benzoate is close to the isopropyl group of this amino alcohol side chain in the 3D conformation, and it's also close in the 2D depiction. So we can make a 2D depiction informed, driven by the 3D coordinates. We then decorate that depiction using the shape here in the dotted line and the chemical or the color features in the filled colored surface. And the key is on the right here. So now using this representation, we can display each overlaid database molecule in this same 2D frame and compare the two side by side. So here is an overlay. The query is in green. The database molecule is in the gray. The database molecule shape match is shown in the middle picture. There's some unmatched shape and the matched shape. The matched shape is shown by the intensity of the brown color. And the quantitative shape similarity is reflected in the shape tabular. So we can use this depiction to understand what this number is telling. Similarly, we can look at the color similarity. The colored circles, again, are the chemical features, color features in the query. The unfilled circles are chemical features in the query not matched by the database molecule. The filled circles are chemical features in the query, color features matched in the database molecule. And this matching and mismatching can help us understand what this color tanomotor means. Now we can look at this individually. We can also, in the ROPS report, look at each molecule with respect to the aggregate results from the entire screen. So here I show you the individual score for a molecule as the vertical dotted red line. And then the histogram next to it shows you the distribution of scores for the database as a whole. And there is the numerical score 1.223. When we break that out by the individual components of the Tanamoto complex, again, the shape, we see this molecule is actually very average in shape. It's really around the peak of the shape Tanamoto distribution. So this molecule has quite a good score shown on the left, but a very average similarity in shape. So clearly, its good score is driven by the fact that it's unusually similar in its color features, in its chemical features, and that's very nicely reflected in the fact that the HIT score here is very far to the right of the distribution for the color Tanimoto in the database as a whole. So this information gives you uh, a unique look at the individual properties of each overlay and a look at that overlay and those scores with respect to the database as a whole. We can then represent this information in a PDF report, three entries per page in the PDF, three database molecules per page. We represent, again, across the top, the individual score information. Uh, to the left is the overall score. In the left depiction is the shape. The central depiction is the color. And on the right, we also add the 2D depiction to help you understand how molecules become similar and different in 2D as well as in 3D, to give you a comparison and a contrast between the 3D and the 2D. So that hopefully will help to analyze, understand, and communicate the results to people who are not necessarily very used to thinking in 3D. This is a very effective tool for communicating your results to chemists who are very much used to thinking about molecules in 2D. Here we have a 2D representation of 3D results that's informed by those 3D results. So that's essentially what I wanted to, to talk about in terms of the functionality. I wanted to remind you that we are looking at a very fundamental physical property of molecules. Shape is a fundamental physical property of molecules, and we therefore expect a shape-based method like ROP to be applicable to a, a very large number of different kinds of problems. So here I show some citations drawn at random from the recent literature, illustrating use against agrochemical and pharmaceutical targets with and without structural information for the protein, and non-traditional targets, DNA, RNA, and so on. So this method works very well, not just for protein-centric problems, but for problems arising around binding other sorts of molecules, DNA, RNA, and so on. That applies also to not only just traditional virtual screening, but leaf hopping. We've had success in cases where we've looked at ligand protein binding problems, protein-protein interaction problems, interaction problems where there's no protein structure available, information where a lot of structure information is available, and we find success in all of these cases. I also mentioned that we've looked at Pose prediction, and that's been becoming quite popular recently, again, simply using a crystallographic ligand to align a set of other molecules too. And again, I briefly mentioned a, a very startlingly popular recent application of rocks, and that's side or off target. Again, looking at this idea that similarity in shape is reflected from 
similarity in biology, that's used for on-target uh, approaches in virtual screening, finding molecules active against the same protein. You can also use graph target, finding molecules that are active on the target you want, but are likely to be inactive against known side targets, cytochromes, microsome binding, and so on. And in a similar vein, looking for things like the drug repurposing idea, taking a known compound, finding it has similar shape to another class of molecule, and discovering this molecule has totally unknown and unexpected biology. So these are the kinds of things we'd expect to see from a fairly fundamental physics-based method. So in sum, it's a very efficient and effective high-speed virtual screening tool where you're not tied to success, um, to knowing the bioactive confirmation is not required. Um, because we're looking at similarity in shape, similarity in 2D and similarity in shape are not the same, so it's also very effective for lead hopping, finding new kinds of chemical matter with similar biology, but very different kinds of molecular architectures. Hopefully, we've spent enough time making the setup through the VROX interface and the analysis through the ROX report as um, easy as possible and to make that analysis as productive as possible. And again, all this is happening at very high speed. It is a rigid technique, so the speed is quantitated on a per complement basis. Depending on the number of complements you generate for each molecule, you're expecting speeds between, again, 20 to 40 molecules per second on modern hardware. So in sum, what we're getting out is an overlay between a query and a database molecule, a set of scores that reflect that. And these overlays and these scores can be used for virtual screening, lead hopping, and alignment at very high speed. Now, recently, I just wanted to put this in front of you, we've finished developing a port of ROX to the GPU, which we call Fast ROX. And the graph there, I think, tells you everything you need to know about why we call it Fast ROX. Uh, it's around a thousand times faster than the CPU version of ROX. We will be having a webinar on some applications of ROX on the GPU or fast ROX in the near future, so keep an eye out for that. And if you want to give a, a, a look at how fast it is, we have an online demo available through our website. The URL is on the slide there. And this enables you to search uh, a pre-prepared, confirmationally expanded database of the e-molecules collection, which is around 8 million molecules. So you can put a, a representation of your molecule into that, and it will search the uh, e-molecules database for you and return you a selection of the best 500 here. So something coming up, which I think would be of interest to a lot of you, so we will keep you abreast of when this is coming, and it should be a very interesting talk. So I'm going to conclude. We have a few minutes for questions. Um, so if anybody has something that's occurred to them, please put it in the chat, and we will go through and answer them as they've been uh, coming in. All right, thank you very much, Paul. Um, again, just to remind everyone, we will be posting uh, the slides and uh, the video uh, on the web, and we will let you know by email where you can find those. Um, and so maybe just to begin, Paul, you could tell people if they're interested in um, getting a license or doing an evaluation, how they might be able to do that. Good question. So uh, if you are um, a nonprofit or a um, commercial uh, user, then you can go to our website, eyesopen.com, and on the front page, there is an evaluation request. If you're an academic user, you can go to, again, eyesopen.com, and on the front page, there is an academic user request. So you can fill in either of those bits of paperwork. They're not too onerous, I hope, and we will be getting a license out to you uh, relatively soon after that. Excellent, thanks. Okay, um, so there was a question. Could you elaborate on the chemistry model used in the, the color portion of rocks? Good question. So uh, I will remind you, because I didn't mention it explicitly, we have a very simple chemistry model built into rocks. The types of chemistry we recognize are shown on the slide here. Six different kinds, acceptors, donors, hydrophobes, rings, anions, and cations. The definition for these features is described or is contained in a a simple text file called what we call the color file. There we go. So the color file defines each type of interaction. So we use a smart pattern here to represent, in this case, a donor. So nitrogen or oxygen with implicit or explicit hydrogen is a donor. And then we define the nature of the interaction between them uh, using donor and donor. So the functional form is, is the nature is attractive. So we want the donor in the database molecule to be. Uh, 
attracted to a donor in the query. The functional form of that uh, attraction is Gaussian, which I mentioned earlier. And by default, each different type of interaction is given a unit weight and a unit radius. So you can do several things. You may add new patterns to describe more specific kinds of chemistry that isn't in there, or make a more specific representation of a kind of functional group you believe is important. You may also look at changing the weight and the radius of different kinds of interaction types, though we've looked at this very extensively and have found very little indication that uniformly tuning those weights and radii has any um, consistent positive effect on the virtual screening results, though for any individual case, some tuning may be helpful. So that's basically the definition, the simple text file containing uh, a pattern, two smarts that defines the type of chemistry, and then this interaction term that tells you um, rocks exactly what kind of interaction it should be. Okay, thanks. Uh, another question, um, why, do, why does rocks uh, stick with a rigid fit rather than adding some flexibility? Good question. So, um, one of the assumptions that a lot of people have is that a flexible fit is going to give you the most right answer you can get. And I think one of the things that we are attempting to do in virtual screening, particularly lead hopping as well, is to balance the amount of signal that you get with the amount of noise. And so really what you're doing is, uh, with flexible methods often, is you increase the amount of signal in that you give often better scores to node actives, but you also give better scores to the decoys as well, because they can also be persuaded to fit better to the query. So the flexible methods often will take many times longer, 10 or 100 times longer often than the rigid variant. And all they do usually is give better scores to all the molecules, which doesn't change the overall ranking. So we don't actually see any particular impact on our virtual screening statistics. Um, all that happens is all the scores rise relatively smoothly. So it takes a lot more time, but doesn't produce any improvement in performance. OK, another question. Um, how many conformers of the database molecules and potentially the query molecule are required for uh, an effective use of rocks? Good question. So this is a graph looking at the AUC mean in blue, median in cream, standard deviation in maroon. When I use 1, 3, 5, and 10 confirmations for the query, my figure of merit is the AUC, again, bounded by 0 and 1. 0.5 is random, 1 is perfect. So for straight up virtual screening experiments, it doesn't make a lot of difference. Statistically, there's no separation between any of those. Numerically, you see a small increase for the use of 10 by the median, but not the mean. So on the other hand, if your question is about lead hopping, where you're looking for different kinds of chemical matter, there is some evidence that says if you choose the different confirmations for the query correctly, you do see a small but statistically significant improvement in using three or five confirmations for the query. So a small number is helpful. Lots don't really do much good for you in lead hopping. And in virtual screening, in general, it doesn't have a huge amount of impact. All that happens is the runtime will scale directly according to the number of confirmations you have for the query. For the database, the story is a little bit similar. Um, if we look at, again, AUCs, now looking not at the number of confirmations for the query, but for the maximum number of confirmations allowed for each database molecule. That's that max comp number on the x-axis there. You'll see that the virtual screening performance is very steady past 25 confirmers as a maximum all the way up to 400, and that goes out to about 800 or so. So for high speed, I suggest you keep the confirmer sampling for rocks in the database to no more than 50. And certainly for techniques like fast rocks, we've been tuning it down closer to 10. So if ranking is your main goal, fewer confirmations accelerate the process, but do nothing to harm your overall performance. OK, uh, I think we're going to close the uh, question and period there just to make sure we don't run on too long. Again, um, I apologize if we didn't get to your question, but we will answer all the questions uh, through email. And uh, in the next couple of days, if you could think up another question, feel free to contact us. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thanks a lot. Bye, everybody.